Candidates are expected to have a thorough understanding of the syllabus details outlined in the accompanying figure. Physical quantities. There are two types of physical quantities as scalar and vector. All physical quantities consist of a numerical magnitude and a unit. For example, the volume of 150 cubic meters. The volume is the physical quantity, it is a scalar quantity, because the volume has no the direction. The value of 150 represents the numerical magnitude or size of the volume. The cubic meters represents the unit of volume. The weight of 500 newtons. The weight is physical quantity, it is a vector quantity, because it has both magnitude and direction. The value of 500 represents the numerical magnitude or size of the weight. The newton is the unit of weight. The direction of weight is always downward. Scalar and vector. A scalar quantity has only magnitude, or size, which is a numerical value. A vector quantity has both magnitude and direction. For example, some scalar quantities in physics include distance, speed, time, mass, volume, energy, and density. For example, some vector quantities in physics include displacement, velocity, acceleration, weight, force, momentum, and gravitational field strength. Distance and displacement. You don't need to know about displacement for IGCSE, but it's useful to know it. When a ball travels along a circular track from point A to point B, the distance traveled from A to B is half of the circumference of the circle. The displacement is the diameter of a circle, and its direction point from A to B, or downward or south. When a ball travels back to point A, the distance traveled from point A to return at point A is equal to the circumference of a circle. The displacement is equal to zero. This is because the ball has returned to its original position. Therefore, we can deduce that. Distance is the total length of the path traveled by an object. Distance is a scalar quantity, which means that it has only magnitude and no direction, and its unit is meter. The displacement is the directed distance from the start to the end points. Displacement is a vector quantity, which means that it has both magnitude and direction, and its unit is meter. Speed and velocity. Average speed is the total distance moved per unit time. Speed is a scalar quantity, which has only magnitude. Its unit is meters per second. Velocity is a speed in a given direction. Velocity is a vector quantity, which has both magnitude and direction. The unit of velocity is the same as the unit of speed, which is meters per second. The magnitude of velocity is equal to speed when an object travels in a straight line and does not change its direction. A car traveling at an initial speed of u for t seconds reaches a final speed of v and covers a distance of s meters, and its acceleration is constant. So, the average speed is u plus v over 2. Total distance moved is s. Total time is t. Therefore, u plus v over 2 equals s over t. You don't need to remember this equation. If u equals v, this means a car is traveling with constant speed. So, the average speed is v. Total distance moved is s. Total time is t. Therefore, v equals s over t. Acceleration. Acceleration is change in velocity per unit time. Acceleration is a vector quantity, which has both magnitude and direction. Its unit is meters per second squared. Therefore, the equation of acceleration is A equals V minus U over T. A is acceleration in meters per second squared. V is final velocity in meters per second. U is initial velocity in meters per second. And T is time taken in seconds. When u equals v, 
it indicates the car is traveling at a constant speed. The change in speed is zero, the acceleration is also zero. When V is more than U, it indicates the car is speeding up. This positive change in velocity is called acceleration. When V is less than U, it indicates the car is slowing down. This negative change in velocity is called deceleration. If a car is moving with uniform acceleration, A, we will get the equation for U, V, A, S as V squared equals U squared plus 2, A, S. If a car moves the same distance as 5 meters every second, this means that a car is traveling with constant speed of 5 meters per second, and acceleration is zero. If a car moves with increasing distance every second, this means that a car is traveling with increasing speed, and it is accelerating. If a car moves with decreasing distance every second, this means that a car is traveling with decreasing speed, and it is decelerating. Investigate the motion of a toy car. This experiment explores the relationship between the height, h, of a wooden track and the average speed of a toy car traveling down it. Begin by setting up the apparatus as shown. Securely clamp the wooden track at the desired height, h. Measure height with a meter rule, ensuring the meter rule is perpendicular to the bench. We use the set square to check that a meter rule perpendicular to the bench. Measure the distance between points A and B using a meter rule. Measure the time it takes for the car to travel distance AB using a stopwatch. Human reaction time can introduce errors when using a stopwatch. To minimize this error, repeat the time measurement at least three times for each height, H, and calculate the average time. Always release the car from the same starting point, A. Record your results in a table similar to the one shown. To find the average speed you will use the equation. Average speed equals distance moved AB divided by time taken. Distance time graph. The graph of distance against time as shown here. We draw a right triangle. Here is change in X and the x-axis represents time. Here is change in y, and the y-axis represents distance. The gradient of graph is the ratio of the change in y-axis to change in x-axis. So, it is the ratio of the change in distance to change in time. Since, the gradient of the graph is the speed of the object. A horizontal line graph with zero gradient indicates the speed is zero and no acceleration. So, the object is at rest. A straight line graph with constant gradient indicates the object is moving at a constant speed and no acceleration. A is steeper than B, so A has a higher speed than B. A curved graph with an increasing gradient indicates the object is moving at increasing speed and it is accelerating. A curved graph with a decreasing gradient indicates the object is moving at decreasing speed and it is decelerating. Finding the speed and average speed using distance time graph. The distance time graph is shown here. Between A to B shows that the gradient is increasing, so the speed is also increasing, and the object is accelerating. Between B to C shows that the gradient is constant, so the speed is also constant, and the acceleration is zero. We can find the constant speed by the gradient between B to C. We draw a right triangle. Here is change in X, or run, is equal to 20, minus 7.5 is equal to 12.5. Here is change in Y, or rise, is equal to 45, minus 10 is equal to 35. Therefore, the speed is equal to 35 divide by 12.5 is equal to 2.8 meters per second. Between C to D shows that the gradient is decreasing, so the speed is also decreasing, and the object is decelerating. Between D to E shows that the gradient is zero, so the speed is zero, no acceleration, and the object is at rest. 
We can find the average speed between A to E by the total distance divided by total time taken. The total distance is 60 meters. The total time is 35 seconds. Therefore, the average speed is equal to 60 divided by 35 is equal to 1.71 meters per second. Velocity time graph. The graph of velocity against time as shown here. We draw a right triangle. Here is change in x, and the x-axis represents time. Here is change in y, and the y-axis represents velocity. The gradient of velocity time graph is the ratio of the change in y-axis to the change in x-axis. So, it is the ratio of change in velocity to change in time. Since, the gradient of the graph is the acceleration of the object. The area under graph is the half of u plus v times t. This is the average velocity, or speed. Since, the area under graph is the distance moved. The speed at any point is simply found by reading the value off the velocity axis. This is because velocity is speed in a given direction, their magnitude are equal when an object travels in a straight line and does not change its direction. A horizontal line graph at the x-axis, with zero gradient indicates the acceleration is zero and a speed is zero, so the object is at rest. A horizontal line graph with zero gradient indicates the acceleration is zero and the object is moving at constant speed of u. Since, the distance moved is the area under graph, which is u times t. A straight line graph with a positive constant gradient indicates the acceleration is constant and the object is moving at increasing speed. We can find the acceleration from v minus u over t. And the distance moved is the area under the graph, which is half of sum of u and v times t. A straight line graph with a negative constant gradient indicates the deceleration is constant and the object is moving at decreasing speed. We can find the acceleration from v minus u over t. And the distance moved is the area under the graph, which is half of sum of u and v times t. A curved graph with an increasing gradient indicates, the acceleration increases, and the object is moving at increasing speed. A curved graph, with a decreasing gradient indicates, the acceleration decreases, and the object is moving at increasing speed. Finding the acceleration, and distance moved using velocity time graph. The velocity time graph, is shown here. Between A to B shows that the gradient is increasing, so the acceleration is also increasing and the speed increases. Between B to C shows that the gradient is positive constant, so the acceleration is also constant and the speed increases. We can find the constant acceleration by the gradient of graph. We draw a right triangle. Here is change in x, or run, is equal to 20 minus 7.5 is equal to 12.5. Here is change in y, or rise, is equal to 50, minus 10 is equal to 40. Since, the acceleration is equal to 40 divided by 12.5 is equal to 3.2 meters per second squared. Between C to D shows that the gradient is decreasing, so the acceleration decreases and the speed increases. Between D to E shows that the gradient is zero, so no acceleration, and the speed is constant at 60 meters per second. Between E to F shows that the gradient is negative constant, so the deceleration is constant, and the speed decreases. We can find the constant deceleration by the gradient of graph. We draw a right triangle. Here is change in Y, or rise, is equal to zero, minus 60 equals minus 60. Here is change in x, or run, is equal to 45, minus 32.5 is equal to 12.5. Since, the deceleration is equal to minus 60 divided by 12.5 equals minus 4.8 meters per second squared. 
We can find the average speed by the total distance moved divided by total time taken. The total distance moved is equal to the area under graph. The area under between A to B is approximately to area at here. So we combine area under graph between A to B with area under between C to D as a rectangle. Since the area of this rectangle is equal to 60 times 7.5 is equal to 450 meters. Area under graph between B to C forms a trapezium shape. So it is equal to 0.5 times sum of 10 and 50 and times 12.5 is equal to 375 meters. Area under graph between D to E to F form a trapezium shape. So, it is equal to 0.5 times sum of 15, and 17.5 times 60 is equal to 675 meters. The total area under graph is equal to 375 plus 450 plus 675 is equal to 1500. The average speed is equal to 1500 divided by 45 is equal to 33.3 meters per second rounded to three significant figures. <laughs> Candidates are expected to have a thorough understanding of the syllabus details outlined in the accompanying figure. Forces. Force is a vector quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Its unit is the newtons. Effects of the forces on object. When forces act on an object, they can cause the object to change in. Shape. Direction of moving. Speed. Forces can be categorized into two main types, contact forces and non-contact forces. A contact force is a force that acts between two objects that are physically touching each other. When two objects collide or come into contact, they exert a force on each other. This force can cause a change in motion, direction, or shape of the objects. When your hand pushes the box, a contact force propels the box forward. This is called the pushing force. Normal reaction force is the perpendicular force that act on an object when it is in contact with a surface. When you place a box on a table, the table exerts an upward force, normal force, to hold the book against gravity. Tension is the force in a string, spring, rubber band, or wire when it is stretched or compressed. When you pull a box with a rope to create tension in the rope, this tension, is the pulling force transmitted through the length of the rope. Friction is the force that opposes the relative motion between two surfaces in contact. When you push a box or pulling a box along the floor with a rope, friction acts in the opposite direction of your applied force. Air or liquid resistance, also known as drag force, is a resistive force that acts on an object moving through air or liquid. Upthrust force or buoyancy force is the upward force that acts on an object that is partially or fully submerged in a fluid. A non-contact force is a force that acts between two objects that are not physically touching. Non-contact forces act through a field, which is an invisible region of space that surrounds an object and exerts a force on other objects within that field. The gravitational force, or weight, due to the gravitational field strength of Earth. Its direction is always downward. Earth's gravity pulls objects towards its center, even without touching them. We can calculate the weight of the object using the equation. W equals m g, where W is weight in newtons, m is mass in kilograms, and g is gravitational field strength in newtons per kilogram. Electrostatic force is the force between the charged objects. Charged objects attract or repel each other depending on their charges and distance between them. Like charges repel, unlike charges attract. Magnetic force is the force between the magnets. 
magnets attract or repel each other without physical contact. Like poles repel, unlike poles attract. When a car is moving to the right as shown, there are the forces acting on a car including the weight acts downward, the total normal reaction forces acting upward at its wheels, the force from the engine acting forward, the air resistance acting backward. When a box is at rest on a rough incline as shown, there are the forces acting on a box including the weight acts downward, the normal reaction force acts upward perpendicular to the slope. The friction acts upward parallel to the slope. When we pull a box with a rope along the incline, causing the box to move up the incline. There are forces acting on the box including. The tension acts up along the slope. The friction acts downward parallel to the slope, because the box is moving up the slope. The weight acts downward. The normal reaction force acts upward perpendicular to the slope. When a box floats on the water, there are forces acting on the box including the weight acts downward, the upthrust acts upward. When a metal sphere is moving downward through the water, there are forces acting on the metal including the weight acts downward, the upthrust acts upward. The water resistance acts upward. Resultant force. The resultant force, or net force, is the single force that has the same effect as all the other forces acting on an object combined. If the resultant force is zero, it is called balance force. If the resultant force is not zero, it is called unbalance force. We can find the resultant force that acting on the object, for example. A box A has forces acting on it as shown. The forces on the left and right sides of the box are balanced. This means the net force acting on the box in the horizontal direction is zero. In the vertical direction, there is a resultant force of 8 newtons acting downwards. This can be found by subtracting the downward force, 22 newtons, from the upward force, 14 newtons. A box B has the forces acting on it as shown. The resultant force acting on the object is 360 newtons to the right. This can be determined by adding the two forces acting to the right, 300 newtons and 60 newtons. A box C has the forces acting on it as shown. There is a resultant force of 1 newton acting to the right. This can be found by adding the two rightward forces, 2 newtons and 4 newtons, and subtracting the leftward force 5 newtons. A box D has the forces acting on it as shown. There is a resultant force of 170 newtons acting to the right. This can be found by subtracting the rightward force of 200 newtons and the leftward force 30 newtons. The three laws of motion, also known as Newton's laws of motion. Newton's first law of motion. The forces on an object are all balanced, then it will just stay still, or else it is already moving it will just carry on at the constant velocity. When a car is at rest then the forces on it must be balanced. So, car's weight acts downward to equal the total normal forces acting upward. When you pushes a car with a force 500 newtons to the right, and a car stay still. This causes the total friction between the tires and the road's surface to act to the left, 500 newtons, for balancing with the pushing force. When a car is moving with constant velocity, then the forces on it must be balanced. So, car's weight acts downward to equal the total normal forces acting upward. The force from engine, 2,500 newtons, acting forward is balanced with the fair resistance, 2,500 newtons, acting backward. When a ball is falling down with constant velocity, then the forces on it must be balanced. The downward weight, 10 newtons, is balanced with the total upward upthrust, 1 newton, and air resistance, 9 newtons. Since, we can conclude that, when no resultant force or balanced force, 
the object is stationary, or moving with constant velocity, and its acceleration is zero. Newton's second law of motion. If there is a resultant force, unbalanced force, then the object will accelerate in that direction. This acceleration can be done by changing the object's velocity. The change in velocity caused the object to start, speeding up, slowing down, stop, and changing direction. If a resultant force acts on an object at rest, the object will accelerate, starting to move, increasing its speed. If a resultant force acts on an object in the opposite direction of its motion, the object will decelerate, eventually coming to a stop. If a resultant force acts on an object in the same direction of its motion, the object will accelerate, further increasing its speed. If a resultant force acts on an object at a perpendicular angle to its direction of motion, the object will change direction, while its speed remains the same. The acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the resultant force. The bigger the force, the greater the acceleration. The acceleration is inversely proportioned to mass of the object. The bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. This can be expressed mathematically as F equals M A. Where F is the resultant force in newtons. M is the mass in kilograms. A is the acceleration in meters per second squared. For example, find the resultant force and acceleration of the box with magnitude and direction like as shown. The resultant force is the subtracting the leftward force 15 newtons with the rightward forces 4 newtons and 2 newtons, resulting 9 newtons to the left. Calculate the acceleration using F equals M A. Substitute F equals 9 newtons, mass equals 2 kilograms. Then A equals 9 divided by 2 is equal to 4.5 meters per second squared to the left. Newton's third law of motion. When object A exerts a force on object B, then object B exerts an equal and opposite force on object A. A pair of forces must be equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, and act on different objects. For example, a book lying on a table exerts a downward force on the table. This is the action force. The table also exerts an equal and opposite force on the book in the upward direction. This is the reaction force. The earth exerts a downward force on the book. This is the action force. The book also exerts an equal and opposite force on the earth in the upward direction. This is the reaction force. While moving on the ground, we push the ground backward with our feet. This is the action force. The ground also exerts a forward force on our feet of equal magnitude in the opposite direction, which makes us move forward. This is the reaction force. A man's hand exerts a force on the wall. This is the action force. The wall also exerts an equal and opposite force on a man's hand in the backward force. This is the reaction force. A rocket exerts a downward force on the burnt gases. This is the action force. The burnt gases also exerts an equal and opposite force on the rocket in an upward direction. This is the reaction force. Stopping distance is the distance a vehicle travels from the moment the brakes are applied to the moment it comes to a complete stop. If a car is traveling at a constant speed, u, and the driver suddenly sees a cow, they will apply the brakes to bring the car to a complete stop. The distance between the point where the driver sees the cow and the point where they apply the brakes is called the reaction distance or thinking distance. The distance traveled by the car from the moment the brakes are applied until it comes to a complete stop is called the braking distance. The total stopping distance is the sum of the reaction distance and the braking distance. We can represent the stopping distance visually using a velocity time graph, as shown. This time, T1, represents the driver's reaction time. The gradient of this section represents the car's constant deceleration due to the brakes. 
This area under the graph is the reaction, or thinking distance, which is U, T1. This area under the graph is the breaking distance, which is half of U times T, 2, minus T, 1. Therefore, the stopping distance is equal to U, T1, plus half of U times T, 2, minus T, 1. The factors affecting the vehicle stopping distance include Vehicle speed Higher speeds result in significantly longer stopping distances which affects both reaction distance and braking distance. Vehicle mass A heavier vehicle has a longer braking distance because it requires more force to decelerate. Road conditions Wet, icy, or uneven roads can extend braking distance by reducing the friction between the tires and the road surface. Reaction time the time it takes for a driver to react to danger and apply the brakes results in the reaction distance. So higher reaction time, higher the reaction distance. Factors affecting the reaction time include Driver age. Reaction time generally increases with age. Intoxication, alcohol, or drugs significantly increases reaction time. Fatigue, being tired significantly increases reaction time. Braking efficiency, the condition of your vehicle's brakes and tires directly affects its ability to slow down. This affects the braking distance. Free fall is the motion of an object under the influence of gravity only. If a feather and a bowling ball are dropped at the same time from the same position in air, the bowling ball will reach the ground first. This happens because air resistance has a greater effect on the feather due to its larger surface area. If a feather and a bowling ball are dropped at the same time from the same position in a vacuum, they will reach the ground at same time and same speed. This is because air resistance has no effect on them. This is called free fall, that applies to all objects regardless of their mass in a vacuum. Free fall describes the motion of an object under the influence of gravity only, we can conclude that. There is no air resistance and only weight acting on the object. The object accelerates constantly towards the ground due to gravity. This acceleration is typically denoted by the symbol G and has a value of approximately 10 meters per second squared. When a ball is moving as free fall, its velocity increases by 10 meters per second every second. This is because its acceleration is approximately constant at 10 meters per second squared. A ball is dropped at rest, its initial velocity is zero and its initial acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. After one second, the ball has descended and its velocity increases from zero to 10 meters per second. After two seconds, the ball has descended a greater distance than it did first second, and its velocity increases to 20 meters per second. After three seconds, the ball has descended a greater distance than it did between one and two seconds, and its velocity increases to 30 meters per second. After four seconds, the ball has descended a greater distance than it did between two and three seconds, and its velocity at four seconds increases to 40 meters per second. The velocity time graph of a free fall. The velocity of a ball increases 10 meters per second every second. Therefore, we plot the graph with the following points. Time 1 second, velocity is 10. Time 2 seconds, velocity is 20. Time 3 seconds, velocity is 30. Time 4 seconds, velocity is 40. Then we draw a straight line from the origin. The velocity time graph shows that the gradient is constant, which indicates that velocity increases with constant acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. We can find the distance moved of the ball from the area under the graph. Distance moved between 0 and 1 second equals 0.5 times 1 times 10 is equal to 5 meters. Distance moved between 1 and 2 seconds equals 0.5 times sum of 10 and 20 and times 1 is equal to 15 meters. Distance moved between 2 and 3 seconds 
equals 0.5 times sum of 20 and 30 and times 1 is equal to 25 meters. Distance moved between 3 and 4 seconds equals 0.5 times sum of 30 and 40 and times 1 is equal to 35 meters. You see that the distance moved of a ball increases for 10 meters every second. The distance time graph of a free fall. We can plot the graph at 1 second, the distance 5 meters. At 2 seconds, the distance is 15 plus 5 is equal to 20 meters. At 3 seconds, the distance is 20 plus 25 is equal to 45 meters. At 4 seconds, the distance is 45 plus 35 is equal to 80 meters. Then we draw a best fit curve. From the distance time graph, shows that the gradient is increasing, which indicates that the velocity is also increasing with constant acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. Terminal velocity is the maximum speed an object reaches when moving through a fluid, liquid or gas, due to the balance forces, no resultant force. When an object is moving through a fluid, there is a drag force due to the fluid. This drag force can increase when the speed of the object increases and the surface area of the object increases. Right now, we will use the symbol of sigma f to represent the resultant force. Consider the terminal velocity of a skydiver. When a skydiver jumps out of airplane, they are initially at rest. Drag force is zero because their speed is zero. Only weight acts on them downward, so the resultant force is equal to their weight. Since, their initial acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. This causes their speed to increases from zero and the drag force also increases. As time passes, drag force acts upward to increase as speed increases. The resultant force is equal to their weight, minus drag force, which acts downward to decrease. This causes their acceleration, also decreases. As drag force increases until it equals their weight. This causes the resultant force is zero. Since, their acceleration also is zero. This causes their speed is constant, this is called terminal velocity. When a parachute is opened, the large surface area increases the drag force to act upward. This causes the resultant force to be drag force, minus their weight, which acts upward. Since, the acceleration is also upwards, so the skydiver decelerates, and their speed decreases. As time is passes, the drag force acts upward to decrease as speed decreases. Since the resultant force acts upward to decrease, and their deceleration also decreases. As the drag force decreases until it equals their weight, so the resultant force is zero. This causes their acceleration is also zero, and their speed is constant again, this speed is called terminal velocity. The velocity time graph of the skydiver's motion is shown on the screen. We know that the gradient of velocity time graph is the acceleration. At point A, initial velocity is zero and initial gradient is 10, this is because the initial acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. Between points A and B, the gradient decreases, this means that the acceleration also decreases, while the velocity still increases. Between B and C, the velocity is constant and this velocity is called terminal velocity. The gradient of graph is zero, this means that the acceleration is also zero. At point C, the parachute is opened, large surface area of the parachute, causing large drag force. This causes the velocity to decreases rapidly. Between C and D, the velocity decreases. The gradient is negative, so the parachutist decelerates. The steepness of the gradient decreases, so the deceleration also decreases. Between D and E, the velocity is constant, which is terminal velocity. The gradient is zero, this means that the acceleration is also zero. The parachutist reaches the ground at point E. The velocity time graph 
showing the difference between free fall and terminal velocity of a ball. When a ball falls through a vacuum, there is no air resistance acting on it. This is called free fall. The velocity time graph of this scenario is a straight line passing through the origin. The constant gradient represents the ball's constant acceleration due to gravity, which is around 10 meters per second squared. This is because only force acting on the ball is its weight acting downwards, so the resultant force is the weight. When a ball falls through air, there is air resistance acting on it. The velocity time graph of this scenario is a curve with a decreasing gradient that eventually becomes horizontal. The initial gradient is around 10 meters per second squared, represents the ball's acceleration due to gravity. This is because at the beginning, the only force acting on the ball is its weight acting downwards, making the weight the initial resultant force. Over time, the decreasing gradient of the graph shows that the acceleration of the ball decreases. This is because as the ball falls faster, air resistance also increases. This air resistance acts in the upward direction, opposing the weight. So, the resultant force is the weight, minus the air resistance, becomes smaller as air resistance increases. When the gradient reaches zero, it indicates that the acceleration is also zero. This causes the velocity of the ball is constant and reaches its terminal velocity. At terminal velocity, the air resistance acting upwards is equal to the weight acting downwards. Since the resultant force is zero, a ball falling through air will take longer and reach the ground at a slower speed compared to a ball falling through a vacuum from the same height. Deformation of material. Investigate how extension varies with applied force for helical springs. Set up the apparatus as shown. Measure the original length of the unstretched spring using a ruler. Hang a load one north on the spring, and then measure the length of the spring. Calculate the extension by subtracting the length from the original length. Repeat the experiment for addition loads of 2 newtons, 3 newtons, 4 newtons, 5 newtons and 6 newtons. Record the results of the length of the spring and its extension in the table. Plot the graph of the load in newtons against the extension in centimeters as shown. We can conclude the results from the graph as follows. Here the result is a straight line graph passing through the origin of the axis. This shows that the spring obeys Hooke's law. Hooke's law states the extension of the spring, string or wire is directly proportional to the force, or load. In this region, the spring is not obeys Hooke's law. At this point is called the limit of proportionality. It is the point where the spring stops obeying Hooke's law and starts to stretch more for each increase in the load force. At this point is called the elastic limit. If the spring is stretched beyond its elastic limit, it will not return to its original length when the weights are removed. D Investigate how extension varies with applied force for elastic bands. We set up the apparatus as shown to investigate how an elastic band stretches under load. If you stretch an elastic band with increasing load forces, we get a graph of load against extension like as shown. The graph is not a straight line, showing that elastic bands do not obey Hooke's law. If the graph of load against extension of material when it loaded and unloaded like as shown. This shows that this material stretches elastically. This is called elastic deformation. This means that a wire, spring or rubber band that stretches elastically will return to its original length once the stretching force is removed. If the graph of load against extension of material when it loaded and unloaded like as shown. This shows that this material stretches plastically. This is called plastic deformation. This means that a wire, spring or rubber band that stretches plastically will not return to its original length once the stretching force is removed. Momentum is a measure of the tendency of an object to keep moving, or of how hard it is to stop it moving. Momentum is defined as the product of mass and velocity. We can write the equation of the momentum as 
P equals M V. Where P is momentum in newton second or kilogram meter per second. M is mass in kilograms. V is the velocity in meters per second. Momentum is a vector quantity due to the velocity as vector. So the direction of momentum is same as the direction of velocity. For example, a 1200 kilogram car is stationary, so its momentum is zero. This is because its velocity is zero. When this car is moving with 25 meters per second, its momentum is 1200 times 25 is equal to 30,000 kilograms meter per second. The same car is moving and it has momentum of 45,000 kilograms meter per second. To find the car's velocity, we can substitute P equals 45,000 kilograms meter per second, M equals 1,200 kilograms. So, its velocity is 45,000 divided by 1,200 is equal to 37.5 meters per second. Momentum, Newton's second law of motion and acceleration. From Newton's second law of motion, F equals M A. From the acceleration of the object, the equals V minus U over T. We combine two equations together as we get F equals M V minus M U over T. This is the change in momentum per unit time. We can conclude that the resultant force is the rate of change in momentum. We can write the equation as shown. Where F is the resultant force in Newton. M V is final momentum. M U is initial momentum. T is time in second. First example. A 2000 kg car accelerates from 10 meters per second to 25 meters per second in 10 seconds. What resultant force produced this acceleration? We substitute M is 2000 kg, V is 25 meters per second, U is 10 meters per second, and T is 10 seconds. So, the resultant force is 3000 newtons. Second example. The first stage of the type of rocket used in moon missions provides an unbalanced upward, away from the Earth, force of 30 meganewtons, and burns for 2.5 minutes. Calculate the increase in the rocket's momentum that results. Convert 30 meganewtons into newtons, it is 30 times 10 to the power of 6 newtons. Convert 2.5 minutes into seconds. It is 2.5 times 60 is equal to 150 seconds. Change in momentum is M V minus M U equals F T. So, increase in momentum equals 30 times 10 to the power of 6 times 150 is equal to 4.5 times 10 to the power of 9 kilograms meters per second. If the rocket has a mass of 3000 tons, what is the velocity of the rocket? after the first stage has completed its burn. Convert 3000 tones into kilograms. It is 3000 times 1000 is equal to 3 times 10 to the power of 6 kilograms. The rocket starts from rest. So U equals 0 and then M U equals 0. Increase in momentum equals M V. Substitute the increase in momentum equals 4.5 times 10 to the power of 9 and m equals 3 times 10 to the power 6. So, v equals 1500 meters per second. Momentum in collision. The total momentum of objects that collide remains the same, this is called the conservation of momentum. Since, total momentum of the system before collision is equal to the total momentum of the system after collision. Let's consider a moving ball A with mass M1 rolls towards stationary ball B with mass M2. So, total momentum before collision is M1 U. The balls after the collision have the velocities as shown. So, total momentum after collision is M1 V1 plus M2 V2. During the impact each ball exerts a force on the other with equal in size and opposite in direction, this is because Newton's three law about action and reaction as shown. 
The forces act each ball for the same amount of time. This means that F times T for each is the same size, but opposite in direction. Since, the change in momentum of ball A is equal in size, but opposite direction with the change in momentum of ball B. So, total momentum before collision is equal to total momentum after collision. For example, find the speed of ball B after the collision like as shown. We given the sign of velocity's direction to the right is positive, and to the left is negative. The total momentum before collision is the sum of ball A's momentum and ball's B momentum, which is 0.4 times 2.5 plus 0.6 times minus 1.2. It is equal to 0.28 kilograms meters per second. The total momentum after collision is 0.4 times minus 0.5 plus 0.6 times V. It is equal to minus 0.2 plus 0.6 EV kilograms meters per second. The total momentum before collision is equal to the total momentum after collision, and then V is 0.8 meters per second, to the right due to the positive sign. Therefore speed of ball B after collision is 0.8 meters per second. Momentum in explosion. The conservation of momentum principle can be applied to explosions. The total momentum of the system before the explosion is equal to the total momentum of the system after the explosion, although there will be a significant increase in the total kinetic energy of the fragments. An explosion involves a rapid release of energy, causing an object to break apart into pieces that fly in different directions. Let's consider an object with mass m that is stationary before the explosion, so its momentum is zero. The object explodes into two fragments with masses m1 and m2, which move apart at velocities v1 and v2, respectively. The total momentum after the explosion is the sum of the momenta of the two fragments, m1 v1 plus m2 v2. Momentum is conserved when during explosion. So, total momentum before explosion equals total momentum after explosion. Then, 0 equals m1 v1 plus m2 v2. And m1 v1 equals minus m2 v2. This equation tells us that the momentum of fragment m1 is equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction to the momentum of fragment m2. As the rocket burns the fuel, generating hot gases that are ejected at high speeds from the rocket. This produces the momentum large amount of fast-moving gases out of the back of the rocket. So, the rocket gains an equal amount of momentum in the opposite direction to that of the moving exhaust gases. Momentum in safety car A larger force means a faster change of momentum, and so greater acceleration. Likewise, if someone's momentum changes very quickly, like in a car crash, the forces on the body will be very large, and more likely to cause injury. Cars are now designed with various safety features that increase the time over which the car's momentum changes in an accident. Crumple zones, airbags, and seat belts in a car increase the collision time. Crumple zones on impact, increasing the impact time taken for the car to stop. Airbags slow you down more gradually, increasing the impact time. This reduces the force acting on the body. Seat belts stretch slightly, increasing the time taken for the wearer to stop. This reduces the forces acting on the chest. For example, a car traveling at 20 meters per second collides with a wall and is brought to rest in just 0.02 seconds. A man in the car has a mass of 50 kilograms. He experiences the same deceleration when he comes into contact with a hard surface in the car, such as the dashboard or the windscreen. What force does the person experience? To find the force acting on the person by this equation, we substitute m is 50 kilograms, v is 0 meters per second, u is 20 meters per second, and t is 0.02 seconds. So, the resultant force is 50,000 newtons. 
turning effect of forces is a measure of the moment forces. When forces act around a fixed point called a pivot they have turning effects called moments. We use these effects all the time in everyday life for some everyday examples as a spanner or wrench uses to loosen a nut, you apply a force that creates an anticlockwise moment, helping you turn the nut. A claw hammer uses to remove a nail. The force applied on the handle to create the moment of force. A scissors work by applying two opposing forces that create a moment, causing the blades to come together and cut through material. A seesaw pivots on a central point, and the moment created by children sitting on either end determines its clockwise or anticlockwise movement. A lever is tools that utilize the concept of moment of force to amplify the applied force, making it easier to lift or move heavy objects. A door is opened by pushing or pulling on a doorknob, you create a moment of force that causes the door to rotate on its hinges. A wheelbarrow distributes the weight of a heavy object, allowing you to apply a smaller force at the handles to move it with a larger moment. Steering wheels of a car is turned to create a moment that alters the direction of the wheels, ultimately controlling the car's direction. Moment of forces is defined as the product of force and perpendicular distance between line of action and pivot. We can write the equation as m equals f d, where m is the moment of force in newton meter. f is force in newtons. d is perpendicular distance from pivot in meters. For first example, a4 newton's force acts on the light beam at a perpendicular distance of 3 meters from the pivot. This causes the clockwise moment to be 3 times 4 is equal to 12 newton meters about the pivot. Second example, a3 newton's force acts on the light beam at a perpendicular distance of 2 meters from the pivot. This causes the anticlockwise moment to be 3 times 2 is equal to 6 newton meters about the pivot. Third example, A4 Newton's force acts at the end of beam along pivot, as shown. This causes the moment is zero due to the force acting along the pivot, causing perpendicular distance from pivot to be zero. Fourth example, A5 Newton's force acts at the end of beam and two meters perpendicular distance between line of action and pivot. This causes the anticlockwise moment to be 5 times 2 is equal to 10 newton meters about the pivot. Fifth example, a diagram shows the forces acting on a light beam and distance of each force from point P. Calculate the sum or resultant moment about P. Clockwise moment about P causes by forces 3 newtons, 1 meter from P and 4 newtons, 3 meters from P. So, Total clockwise moment equals 4 times 3 plus 3 times 1 is equal to 15 newtons meter. Anticlockwise moment about P causes by only 2 newtons, 1 meter from P. So, anticlockwise moment equals 2 times 1 is equal to 2 newtons meters. You see that larger total clockwise moment than clockwise moment. So the resultant moment equals 15 minus 2 is equal to 13 newtons meter in clockwise. The principle of moment states that if an object is in equilibrium, the total of clockwise moment is equal to the total anticlockwise moment about the pivot. The conditions for equilibrium of an object are. There is no resultant force acting on the object. There is no resultant moment acting on the object, this is the principle of moment. For example, Someone is trying to balance a plank with particles A and B. The plank has negligible weight. Calculate the moment of the forces about point O and determine if the plank will balance. If not, calculate the force acting on the plank at P. Calculate the moment of 4 newtons force about point O, which is 4 times 4 is equal to 16 newton meters in clockwise. Calculate the moment of 6 newtons force about point O which is 2 times 6 is equal to 12 newton meters in anticlockwise. Since, the clockwise moment is greater than the anticlockwise moment, the plank will rotate clockwise. Resultant moment equals 16, 
minus 12 is equal to 4 newtons meter. To balance the plank, we need to add an additional downward force at point P that will create anticlockwise moment of 4 newton meters. Perpendicular distance between point P to pivot O is 4 meters. So, force F equals 4 divided by 4 is equal to 1 newton. Therefore, the plank will balance if a force of 1 newton is applied downward at point P. Center of gravity. The center of gravity is sometimes called the center of mass. It is the point where the whole of the weight of the object appears to act. The weight of all object acts through the center of gravity. For example, the center of gravity of the human is about here. The center of gravity of an apple is about here. The center of gravity of a magnet is here. A uniform object's center of gravity is at the middle of the object. For example, a uniform cylinder has its center of gravity at here. A uniform sphere has its center of gravity at the center. A uniform cube has its center of gravity at here. A uniform wooden meter rule has its center of gravity at the 50 centimeters mark. The object will always balance around its center of gravity. For example, the wooden meter rule is balancing on the pivot at the 50 centimeters mark, like as shown. You can try balancing a pencil on your finger, like as shown. The people is walking on the rope, like as shows. Someone of weight 500 newtons is standing on a uniform plank 6 meter long and weighing 250 newtons. The plank is supported by two trestles, as shown. Calculate that the upward force is x and y exerted by the trestles on the plank. The plank is uniform, so the center of gravity is the middle of the plank equals 2.5 meters from trestle y. The plank is equilibrium because it is at rest and not turning. So, the principle of moments can be applied. Finding x, let's take trestle y as the pivot. The total clockwise moment about y equals the total anticlockwise moment about y. Total clockwise moment, 5 times x, and equal to total anticlockwise moment, 500 times 3 plus 250 times 2.5. We will get 5x equals 2125. So, x equals 425 newtons. Finding y using total upward force on the plank equals total downward force on the plank, because no resultant force acts on the plank. Total upward force is 425 plus, y equals total downward force, is 500 plus, 250. So, y equals 325 newtons. A diagram shows an arm with the hand holding a weight of 120 newtons. The 20 newtons force is the weight of the forearm, acting at the center of gravity. F is the force in the muscle of the upper arm. P is the point in the elbow about which the arm pivots. The distances of the forces from point P are shown. By taking moments about point P, calculate the force F. A diagram shows an arm is equilibrium, or balance, so total clockwise moment equals total anticlockwise moment. Total clockwise moment causes by 20 newtons force, 15 centimeters from P, and 120 newtons force, 33 centimeters from P. So, total clockwise moment is 20 times 15 plus 120 times 33 is equal to 4260 newtons meter. Total anticlockwise moment is force F times 2. Therefore, force F is 4260 divided by 2 is equal to 2130 newtons. A force acts on the forearm at point P. Calculate this force and state its direction. We can apply the total upward acting on arm equals total downward force acting on arm, due to equilibrium of arm. Total upward force equals 2130 newtons. 
Total downward force equals 20 plus 140 is equal to 140 newtons. Total upward force is more than total downward force. To balance the arm, we need to add an additional downward force at point P. The magnitude of this force equals 2130 minus 140 is equal to 1990 newtons. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, I would be grateful if you would subscribe, share, like and leave a positive comment. Your support will encourage me to create more content. Thank you.